right, y'all. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. We can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash scotthortonshow. All right, you guys on the line, I've got the great Gareth Porter, and he's the guy that wrote the book, two books on Iran, one on the nuclear program, the other on Trump's campaign of maximum pressure, and uh, he's written 10 million great articles for Truth Out and Truth Dig and Antiwar.com and Consortium News and the American Conservative Magazine, and this one is at the Gray Zone. After Beirut Blast... Israel revives tale of Hezbollah ammonium nitrate terror plots. Oh, I'm shaking in my boots. Welcome back to the show, Gareth. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be back again. Yes, sir. Well, Israelis making claims about explosives. I'm terrified. What might it be? And, and of course, you go through, you got the whole litany, and you unravel every bit of it. Um, this has been going on for years. Is that right? The Israelis have been trying to gin up stories yes. of... Hezbollah, how do you say Hezbollah, uh, well, info bombs? I Hezbollah, but, uh, you know, different pronunciations for different folks. I think different strokes for different folks. <laughs> All right. It seems like it should rhyme with Allah, right? Hezbollah. Well, probably... that, would be, that would be one way of looking at it, possibly, yes. I've been so, yeah, scolded right. before for calling it Hezbollah, but I just listened to, you know, I learned that from TV when I was a kid. I don't... Sure. Anyways. So, so, so... Not that they ever told me who they were or what they were about. They just said they were scary. So, Yeah. So, so Mossad has been uh, pushing this line for years now um, on a piecemeal basis that uh, Hezbollah has been uh, you know, acquiring and storing ammonium nitrate in various countries. Always, of course, the Israelis claim for the purpose of planning eventual uh, terrorist attacks primarily against Israel because they are deathly afraid, well, not deathly afraid, but they're claiming to be afraid of uh, the the Iranians and Hezbollah taking revenge against Israel for all of the things that, uh, is, that the uh, Israelis have done against both of them. Um, and so that's been the backdrop for a series of uh, a series of storylines that have come out uh, starting in, in 2012 and uh, continuing through the last eight years or so. And now the Israelis have revived this series and packaged them for maximum uh, effect politically and, and in terms of propaganda effect uh, by uh, getting this putting the story together and uh, having it um, become a, a major sort of propaganda theme now. And, and you begin to see places like uh, Die Welt and uh, uh, other cooperative um, uh, uh, magazines and, and newspapers uh, allude to this uh, theme uh, and I note in my piece that even the Washington Post, not even the Washington Post, but especially the Washington Post, the day after the explosion in Beirut, um, I think it was at the end or toward the end of a piece that um, was was sort of uh, thinking about, well, what could have caused all this? Uh, the, the, the authors of the Post piece said that um, Hezbollah has been known to have uh, uh, been acquainted with, or I've forgotten the exact wording, but to have acquired ammonium nitrate over the years uh, for terrorist attacks. So, uh, you know, this is a one one sentence nutshell of the Israeli propaganda line. Nobody else in the uh, corporate media in the United States has seen fit to do this story surprised me a little bit that that's not happened yet, but I expect it'll still be seeping out in the coming weeks and months. All right. Well, so let's go back. Tell us the story of yeah. uh, Thailand and Cyprus and whatever sure. else they claim to have here. 
Right. So, so yeah, the first one in this uh, uh, very long series of incidents or alleged incidents, because in one case, absolutely nothing did happen at all <laughs> uh, to, to even cause the suspicion or to, to justify uh, the kind of story that the, the Mossads are, have been, have been uh, ginning up. But uh, in Bangkok in 2012, the uh, Thai police arrested a uh, Canadian, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, sorry, in this case, Swedish uh, Lebanese uh, joint uh, citizen um, who had just arrived uh, in the country. And uh, as soon as he arrived, they you know, took him in and accused him of uh, being a terrorist and uh, being a Hezbollah terrorist, and uh, also of uh, having ammonium nitrate for the purpose of terrorism. Um, ammonia, ammonium nitrate being uh, an illegal substance in Thailand, uh, it looked like an open and shut case, but there are a few problems with that. Um, and to begin with, uh, they really had no uh, evidence whatsoever, uh, no particular reason to believe uh, that uh, the the suspect um, uh, Hussein Atris was uh, even has belonged to Hezbollah or was certainly was a Hezbollah operative. Uh, he he stoutly denied it, denies it to this day, um, and they they did not have any evidence, direct or indirect, of of that sort of affinity or affiliation. And the second thing is that Atris was able to show that he had um, the documents to prove that he had ammonium nitrate for the purpose of a legitimate uh, uh, export business, um, along with the export of electric fans and um, a copy paper, which he had been uh, storing there for the purpose of being able to export to specific places where he'd found uh, uh, the uh, customers. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was in Africa uh, that he had, uh, Liberia, that he had found a, uh, a taker for ammonium nitrate. And uh, so, you know, there was, uh, there was reason to believe that he was legit. He was on the level. Um, but, but of course, the Mossad people and their allies in the Thai police weren't going to have any of that. They had somebody who they wanted to convict, um, and uh, they were determined to go ahead and do that. And, and so they brought the charges against him. And uh, uh, the, the only problem that uh, sort of came up here, I mean, they, they basically uh, convicted him, and, and he served, if I remember correctly, something like uh, two and a half a little over two and a half years of a four-year sentence in the end for uh, uh, owning uh, a, an illegal substance. Now, the, the problem here is that, um, that ammonium nitrate was illegal, but the ammonium nitrate that he had was in the form of these ice packs or, or cold packs that have ammonium nitrate in them, but it's in a water solution. Um, that uh, means that it's not readily available for, I mean, it can be turned into an explosive, but it's not easily used as an explosive uh, in the immediate sense. Sort of like busting and, him uh, for having too much Sudafed and calling it yeah, speed. Yeah, when this, this, this is a commercial product that's bought and sold all over the world. It's obviously exported from various countries to other uh, countries. And so, you know, th this is, nobody had ever tried to suggest that the ownership of cold packs or the intention to export cold packs uh, is somehow illegal or a sign of a terrorist intent. But they did it in this case because Mossad was pressuring them to do it. Now, the other thing that came up in regard to this case uh, is that, the, uh, that somehow or other, uh, not just uh, ammonium nitrate cold packs, but um, urea fertilizer showed up in this guy's uh, warehouse where he stored the, uh, the other items that he was intending to export. And uh, uh, he swore 
in an interview with uh, Afton Bladet, a correspondent in Bangkok, that he never, ever done any business with urea fertilizer. It just wasn't something that he dealt with. And it makes sense because, uh, you know, it was not uh, in the same category as the other things that he did. Um, it, it was not a sort of small consumer uh, item. So um, the question is, where did it come from? And uh, Atrice uh, claims, uh, I think quite credibly, that somebody uh, put it there in order to implicate him further because they were afraid that just having ammonium nitrate uh, in these uh, cold packs might not be viewed as illegal at all, as it shouldn't have been. <laughs> so, uh, so there's some reason to suspect, in fact, that Mossad simply uh, acted on its own. And once they uh, had the information about the guy, they found his warehouse very easily. And um, they, they had slipped the um, uh, urea fertilizer in there. Apparently, in the, it was uh, in bags that were uh, l uh, kitty litter bags, uh, supposedly. But in any case, uh, there's a lot of suspicious elements surrounding the case. And um, in in fact, uh, very little reason to believe that this guy was planning, uh, you know, was helping Hezbollah plan a, a terrorist attack mm -hmm. or a series of terrorist attacks. We say in the piece that a court ultimately found that there was no evidence to support the contention that he was in any way involved with Hezbollah. That's right. That you are correct. That's the other thing that happened. They did. They said explicitly that they didn't find any. They didn't have any evidence that he was in fact Hezbollah, which simply puts the uh, exclamation point on the point that I just made. Yeah. So he's got cold packs. He's buying and selling some things that in no other case have they said, aha, you could somehow get the fertilizer or whatever chemical out of there and, and make explosives out of it. And he wasn't even tied to Hezbollah. And so right. there really was right. no case at all. Yeah, it's it's really highly, highly questionable, uh, a very very suspicious uh, case that that clearly involves Mossad as a primary, the, the primary agent behind it, because they're the ones, and I should have prefaced my remarks by, by mentioning that uh, throughout uh, all these countries where Hezbollah, excuse me, where Mossad has um, allies in the counterterrorism, police, intelligence services, uh, they always have arrangements which allow them to pinpoint uh, anybody that's coming into the country that they want the government to nab ahead of time, and that is clearly what has happened in this what what happened in this case with uh, La Atrice. Yeah, and you think they made a mistake at first, and then they just finished framing him up, or they just decided to pin some bomb plot on some schmuck. Well, I mean, I think they picked him out as somebody who was Lebanese and, uh, you know, was in business and therefore they wanted a tail on him. And, uh, you know, they quickly, you know, had the had the information that they needed to. I mean, when they found ammonium nitrate in packs, they said, hmm, maybe we can use this. Right. I mean, this yeah. is this is my own mind at work, but I think it's a very reasonable. Sure set of, of sup suppositions. World's greatest state sponsor of terrorism. You hear that? Hezbollah yes. reaching all the way east to Thailand to blow Indeed. up innocent people. What a great right. story. Right. <laughs> hey, man, you guys are going to love No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. It's a fun and interesting read all about how to run your high-tech company like a good libertarian should. Forget all the junk. Read No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. Find it in the margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all, here's the thing. Donate $100 to The Scott Horton Show, and you can get a QR code commodity disc as my gift to you. It's a one-ounce silver disc with a QR code on the back. You take a picture of it with your phone, and it gives you the instant spot price and lets you know what that silver, that ounce of silver is worth on the market in Federal Reserve notes in real time. It's the future of currency in the past two. Commoditydiscs.com or just go to scotthorton.org 
slash donate. Hey guys, Scott Horton here for expanddesigns.com. Harley Abbott and his crew do an outstanding job designing, building, and maintaining my sites, and they'll do great work for you. You need a new website? Go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott and save 500 bucks. Hey y'all, Mike Swanson is a successful Wall Street trader with an Austrian school understanding of the markets, and therefore he has great advice to share with you. Check out Mike's work and sign up for his list at wallstreetwindow.com. And that's what you'll get, a window into all of Mike's trades. He'll explain what he's buying and selling and expecting and why. I know you'll learn and earn a lot. Wallstreetwindow.com. That's wallstreetwindow.com. All right, Cyprus. Cyprus. Cyprus is even more interesting because in some ways... Um, be, because once again, you have a question of Mossad uh, having played uh, not just an active role in initiating the arrest of uh, a, a Lebanese, uh, in this case, Canadian Lebanese, um, uh, who had just entered the country, but somebody who they uh, had started to put a tail on uh, and continued to monitor all of his movements and his calls and everything. They knew everything about him. Um, and again, quickly, were, you know, they knew where he was staying, of course. And um, within a few days, he gets arrested. And then after he's arrested, they find a, uh, you know, this, this load of, of ammonium nitrate uh, in his in the basement of this building. Now again, um, the the individual um, clearly, you know, at first he absolutely denied the entire story, denied everything they're accusing him of. And again, we know that uh, both Mossad and its allies always, always uh, draw up a confession, which is what Mossad wants the uh, individual that. In this case, of course, Hezbollah, they want uh, the suspected Hezbollah person to admit to being a Hezbollah terrorist and to having ammonium nitrate for that purpose. That's the whole point of the exercise. OK. And in this case, um, you know, the the individual finally uh, reached a plea bargain after roughly a month. Um, in which he admitted to having been a member of Hezbollah's uh, overseas uh, operati operations, um, admitted that he had ammonium nitrate, and according to what was made public, admitted to the idea that it was for, for terrorist purposes. But the fact is that we never heard what his defense was. We never heard what his own account was. We never heard what he was forced to say by his interrogators or, you know, the extent to which Mossad interrogated him, which, uh, in fact, has happened elsewhere. We know it happened in Kenya that for 14 days Mossad had exclusive access uh, to, to Iranian guys. Um, and this is a uh, uh, this is a pattern. We know it's happened elsewhere. So we just don't know what happened in the intervening weeks after he had denied the entire story. What we do know is that his defense lawyer, who obviously advised him, well, you better take the plea here because they've got this evidence uh, in the basement that uh, makes it look like you're guilty. Uh, the the defense lawyer uh, within two and a half years had become the defense minister of Cyprus. So this is not your ordinary defense lawyer. This is somebody who has political ambitions and uh, was was clearly on his way up uh, in in Cyprus uh, politics and uh, expected to get something like uh, a, a defense ministership within a matter of uh, some short, relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's one factor. The other thing about this case that is very important 
um, and, and really helps to provide uh, an alternative explanation for how this went down is an account in the Kuwaiti daily newspaper Al Jarida, which uh, is significant because Al Jarida is a newspaper that the Israelis have often used to leak stories to the Arab Middle East that they think are important to their propaganda line. Um, and in this case, Al Jarida reported, clearly based on a Mossad source that they had, uh, their account of how you know, Mossad had helped to track down this guy and got him convicted. And what the account says, unbelievably, is that um, basically Mossad had a tail on him from the moment he arrived or even before they were uh, following his phone calls, they knew who he was calling and everything. And they uh, did this for several days. And then uh, just before the conviction uh, of this guy or, or the arrest of this guy, lo and behold, uh, the, the load of ammonium nitrate uh, arrives. And you know, that's the wording in the Al Jarida piece, which leads one to believe that there was a very a strange coincidence here that uh, the arrival of the ammonium nitrate preceded just within hours or a day or so the arrest of this guy. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just it's it's just too convenient to be uh, a complete coincidence. And the other explanation would be that, in fact, it was Mossad itself that supplied the ammonium nitrate. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a very fascinating little by uh, uh, by play. That's part of this story about uh, about uh, a guy named uh, Abdallah Abdallah. Right. All right. So now, now this case, there are two more yeah, London yeah. and Germany, too, huh? That's right. Now we, we've got, uh, first of all, uh, though, we've got um, New York City. Oh, OK. New York City uh, goes back to around 2015. Um, the the storyline about ammonium nitrate goes back to, to uh, 2015 or, or even earlier. And that is a story that was cooked up by um, the FBI in order to help um, politically, obviously, the Justice Department come up with a conviction of this poor Lebanese named Ali Kurani, who uh, is a very complicated story, and I, I, I don't even know the full story myself, but um, the guy was not really a genuine Hezbollah operative in New York City. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, doing some things, you know, sort of pro forma in order to ingratiate himself with the FBI and in order to um, apparently impress his ex-wife uh, as part of a, a very nasty divorce um, and, and uh, uh, settlement that involved kids and in order to be able to visit his kids because he needed American citizenship. So the FBI uh, trying to help get a conviction for for the Justice Department um, uh, comes up with a uh, with the information that this guy Ali Kurani, uh, soon after he became a U.S. citizen, he'd visited Guangzhou, I believe it's the fourth largest city in China, a city of uh, 10 million people, uh, and they then use that to try to prove that, in fact, he was there or, or to suggest that he was there in order to investigate the acquisition of ammonium nitrate, because that was the location of the same company that uh, had provided the ammonium nitrate in the case of, um, uh, I guess it was uh, Cyprus. But in any case, um, you know, this was this absurd uh, sort of uh, assumption was all they had. This was the only alleged evidence they had that he had anything to do with 
a, a plot to uh, store ammonium nitrate or acquire ammonium nitrate for Hezbollah for terrorist purposes. That he so, went so that to is, that this guy had traveled to a city where they manufacture <laughs> those cold packs that the other guy got framed up with. That is correct. And and I mean, they had no other information. They didn't they didn't have any information that he actually visited it or that he even went into the city. They don't even know that he didn't use the, the airport at Guangzhou, which is where they say they tracked him to. Uh, that that he didn't go from there to Hong Kong, <laughs> so it, it it is really uh, you know the the sort of the most ludicrous kind of suggestion that I can imagine. Crazy. Okay, now uh, England and Germany both, huh? Right, right. Now these these two you can sort of bracket together because uh, these are two cases where Mossad went to the government and said, look. Um, you know, we uh, we know that you are weighing the question of whether you're going to outlaw, uh, ban Hezbollah on your territory, but you haven't made the decision yet. And we think that you should be aware of the uh, fact that we've already done the work. We've done the research, uh, the intelligence work, and we have found um uh, the places where Hezbollah has been storing ammonium nitrate in the outskirts of London, in the case of the UK, and in southern Germany, in the case of Germany. And so um, in one case in, in London, it was 2015. In, in Germany, it was 2019. And, um, and, and the, uh, the Israeli line, the Mossad line here is that uh, in both cases, the governments, of course, found that uh, they had uh, that that Mossad had been right, that they found that Hezbollah had indeed uncovered this plot in both in both countries to store ammonium nitrate for terrorist operations by the by the Hezbollah. But in fact, there's not the slightest scintilla of evidence in either case that that's what happened. In fact, um, it's obvious from the absence of any mention in official statements, documents, or press leaks of any kind that from the government that, the, uh, that Hezbollah had done anything of the sort. And in fact, the only leak uh, about um, Hezbollah having stored ammonium nitrate in London was from Mossad uh, to the Telegraph, the, the uh, right-wing Rupert Mur Murdoch owned, or at yeah. least it was Rupert Murdoch owned newspaper that is uh, relentlessly, uh, you know, following the Israeli line on everything that has to do with Israel. So in other words, so, uh, because the because the police let these guys go, whoever was responsible for it, that means that either they weren't Hezbollah at all or they were working for Scotland Yard. <laughs> they were supposed to have well, yeah, it, I guess. Apparently, uh, reportedly, of course, we don't know for sure, but apparently there was one person who was arrested without any charges being made and then, you know, finally freed. I don't know how long they kept him. Um, but obviously they decided that they didn't have any evidence to support what uh, what they were being told by Mossad. And in the case of Germany, um, the day that Germany did, in fact, um, announce in 2019, I believe it was in May of 2019, uh, that, I'm sorry, no, it was May, uh, it was early 2020, excuse me, it was early 2020 that Germany announced that they were banning Hezbollah from German territory. Uh, they carried out a series of raids against uh, mosques that were considered to be pro-Hezbollah, but they did absolutely nothing, made no statement of any kind, suggesting that there was anything, uh, that anything had happened involving ammonium nitrate uh, within German borders. So the whole story seems to fall flat on its face. And in fact, uh, just one personal note that I'll add, I called the German embassy information service and I said, look, um, I'm doing a story about, uh, you know, the subject of, that involves German, um, Germany and Hezbollah. And, and I'm uh, wondering if there is, you have any information whatsoever indicating that there were uh, Hezbollah stores of ammonium nitrate in Germany at any time. 
And uh, the person who answered uh, my call said, no, we've never heard of anything of that sort. There you go. So uh, there you have it, everybody. The world's greatest state sponsor of terrorism, Thailand and Cyprus and uh, New York City here. And, um, of course, um, uh, England and Germany, they're going to kill us all. And the fact <laughs> that uh, not a single one of these is true <laughs> matters at all. It's, uh, yeah, no, the there's it's all still true even though it's not. Everybody it's knows not, that. It's 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 not um, the the all the news that's fit to print. It's it's publishing all the news that fits. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we got a narrative here. We're sticking to it. Don't forget yeah, Argentina, right. and don't forget that time that they were gonna blow up the Saudi ambassador in the restaurant in Georgetown. No, not Georgetown. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, mass killings, mass killings. Yeah, those only didn't make the cut because they didn't have Anfo as part of those fake plots. The, right. That was different. But, um, you know, you got to hand it to them. They've, uh, they've done a good job of building a narrative. The fact that it's built out of a bunch of pieces of lies, notwithstanding, you know, it's part right. of the deal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's timely uh, because of the Beirut explosion. It's now the time to push this forward. Yep. Um, and so we'll see. We'll I got a lot of questions whether... right away. Is it true that it was Hezbollah explosives that happened with the thing? So they got that mm. narrative out there pretty powerfully, pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely credible to everybody in the national security elite and in the media elite in this country and the political elite in this country. And, and I suspect in other parts of, uh, Europe as well. Yeah, this, not so uh, much this... in Lebanon. I mean, they probably don't care whether the Lebanese can see right through it or not. They no, know they what happened care. there. They don't care about that. And They're, Hezbollah is part of the government that really dropped the ball on that one, so they're responsible in that way, but that's in the same way that the rest of them are too, and that's entirely different. Yeah, but I have to point out, uh, Scott, that, that since uh, you know my story was published, we have this uh, these stories, uh, particularly in the German press, that uh, are coming obviously from from Mossad and from the Israelis, uh, suggesting that now now we have evidence that the uh, the invoice or invoices I should say for the ammonium nitrate that was shipped and it was being shipped and ended up in the port of Beirut was associated with a bank in Africa that had Shiite ownership and therefore it's linked to Hezbollah. I mean, oh, that is, okay. that's what we can expect to see more of the same of this sort of thing. Hmm. Um, and so, and you know and what, course, I guess I, maybe I take that back. I mean, maybe this information op really is meant to impress the Lebanese people and try to weaken support for Hezbollah there rather than just oh, no doubt. getting in the minds no of the floor things. noise of the world. Yeah. It's playing into politics in, in Lebanon. No question about it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's going to make any difference. Um, man. Well, there you go, guys. Uh, Gareth Porter on the case of every lie told about Iran. <laughs> And their uh, friends and allies in the interest of peace, simple as that, in the interest of protecting this country from the right. most destructive aspects of our empire. Thank you, Gareth. My pleasure. Thanks again, Scott. All right, you guys. And that is at antiwar.com, reprinted from the gray zone. After Beirut blast, Israel revives tale of Hezbollah ammonium nitrate terror plots. Debunked. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.